Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it is Tuesday, June 9th, um, and this is a VetCat webinar um, featuring Dr. Stephanie Goldschmidt from the University of Minnesota in St. Paul, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us tonight. Our webinar tonight is all about the VetCat and showing you um, tools and tricks on how to use it. And Dr. Goldschmidt will be sharing her experiences with her VetCat, which she's had since January. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. We will send you a recording of the webinar. Um, please submit your questions via the chat function highlighted below in orange. Dr. Simon is also on the call with us, so he will answer questions directly. Um, and Dr. Goldsmith will also be taking questions at breaks during the webinar tonight. If you don't get to your question during the session, we'll definitely answer them at the end as time permits. And you'll also have access to vetcat.com where a lot of your questions can be answered or by directly reaching out to Dr. Sarment or Dr. Goldschmidt after the webinar. A little bit about our speaker tonight. Dr. Goldschmidt is the section chief of the dentistry and oral surgery department at the University of Minnesota. She completed her dentistry and oral surgeries residency at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and received her, web, um, her veterinary degree from the Royal School of Veterinary Studies at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. As a subspecialty clinical and research Interests include oral oncologic surgery, periodontal disease pre prevention, and advanced treatment of dental trauma with root canal therapy and crown replacement. Um, Dr. Goldsmith has had her vet cat since January, and she has a lot of fun things to share. So, Dr. Goldsmith, are you ready to share your screen with us? Yeah, I'll take over. Wonderful. Okay, and everybody the screen? Yes. Okay, super. So um, like they said, I've had my vet cats for about six months. So I put together kind of a compilation of cases where I felt that it really changed how I used, like how my overall treatment planning and how I used it in kind of conjunction with dental radiographs to change kind of my treatment plan, my surgical plan, how I went about the case in general. So just kind of the basis on how we use the vet cat. So the first thing we tend to do is they come into the room, we induce them when they're in sternal, and then you can see there's this little kind of base plate that we put on top of the table. Um, so we bring their head onto that, we do our vet cat, then we'll do all our maxillary radiographs in sternal, then we flip them into dorsal, we do our mandibular radiographs, and we do our surgery in dorsal. Then if we need to repeat the uh, scan at any time intraoperatively, we'll repeat it in um, dorsal. So you can do it in sternal or dorsal. We usually do our first scan in sternal. So we do scan every single patient um, and also take radiographs. So we use them in combination, except for certain times like jaw fractures or bony tumors where we'll often just do the comb beam. So I put together, as I said, kind of a number of cases that I'll kind of go through. And then after each case, I'll just take a wee break for specific questions. And then I have a time for questions at the end as well. So the first case that I have is Maya. So Maya was an 11-year-old female spared Labrador retriever. And she presented for an annual cleaning. Historically, we've been monitoring her for external replacement resorption and mild periodontal disease. So you can see in 2017, when we first saw her, she kind of had this bony perforation kind of right by the middle mental foramen, but it was very poorly defined. We didn't really think anything of it. So we decided to monitor. You can see again, we saw her in 2018. Unfortunately, this is a very bad x-ray. I apologize. Um, but you can see that it's still there, ill-defined. We don't really make anything of it. So we continue to keep an eye on it. We then saw this case again in 2020, um, and you can see now this kind of osseous proliferation is not only larger, but it has this kind of lucency around it, which is starting to become more concerning. So at this point, we actually told the owner we would recommend biopsy because we want to say, is this a fiber osseous disease? Is this potentially something like a low-grade osteosarcoma, or is this just benign bone proliferation we don't need to worry about? 
But what you can appreciate on the radiograph is it's very hard to know where this bone proliferation is. Is it on the buccal aspect? Is it on the lingual aspect? Is it adhered to the bone itself? Um, so surgically approaching this just off a dental radiograph would be very challenging. So you can then see we did the comb beam, which then allowed us to fully appreciate where that bony proliferation was. So not only could we tell that it was a defined osseous mass that was sitting in the mandibular canal, but we also could tell that it was much more lingual than we anticipated. Um, and the thing that was really cool that we did is we were able to measure from the middle mental foramen exactly how far this bony proliferation was. So we actually did decide to approach this buccally, but we were able to make an enlarged kind of osteotomy right by the middle mental foramen, measure exactly how deep we had to go, and then approach this kind of bony tissue to biopsy it. Um, and realistically, if I was planning this just off radiographs, I would be really nervous about you know, how deep is this? I don't know what I should be anticipating. I don't know how best to approach it. So it totally changed how we approached this bony mass for surgical biopsy. Any questions on that case? So um, kind of the next few cases I'm gonna go through are how we used the vet cat for periodontal disease. Um, so we'll kind of do a few perioendo cases, then a few tumors, and then kind of jaw fractures. And um, But I find that it's extremely, extremely helpful for making periodontal disease decisions, which I actually didn't anticipate. I thought I would still rely very heavily on dental radiographs, but um, I'll kind of show you here how it really gives us a lot more information. So this is Opie. He's a six-year-old male neuter boxer, and he presented for a fractured tooth and just overall periodontal disease treatment. So you can see when we look at the dental radiographs, we're looking at the left maxilla here. In this area between 207 and 208, you can definitely appreciate, you know, there's some vertical bone loss. Um, there was a very minimal pocketing, but really overall, I'm not too worried about the eight. I would recommend taking out the seven, potentially root planing and monitoring this maxillary fourth premolar, especially when we look at it at the lateral. Again, it's not the best x-ray in the world, but the periodontal ligament space looks pretty unexciting. Um, there's too much crowding to really tell about bone loss, but overall, I wasn't that worried about this tooth based on dental radiographs alone. However, when we see the comb beam, when you look on the axial, you can really appreciate how severe that bone loss was. So when we look at what we're seeing is we're catching the seven, which is rotated, and then we're catching the mesial root of the eight. And when we look at this, we can see there's extremely significant vertical bone loss that we weren't appreciating on the radiograph. And then when we look at it on the coronal view, look at all of this vertical bone loss completely encircling that mesial root. So then what I decided to do is something that I really like to do. It's called a two-point oblique cut. And I'll cut from mesial to distal through a tooth root. And the reason I really like this is it makes it show up kind of similar to how a radiograph would look. So as I started to become more comfortable with using the comb beam CT, I often would make this cut um, just as a comparison to help me kind of think about it like I normally would think about an x-ray. So you can see when we made this cut, there's very, very severe vertical bone loss on the mesial root, much more severe than we could appreciate on the radiographs. But the other thing we picked up is it appears that there's a periapical lucency. So there's this irregularity on the distal root, which we did not pick up on radiographs. So at first I was like, oh, maybe this isn't real because that's what's I think very challenging when you don't see something on rads and you see it on the comb beam, you have to get used to saying, you know, which one of these do I trust? Um, so then I said, okay, well, I'm going to see it in different views. So I zoomed in very closely on a sagittal view. So you can see when we look at the same view of the 208 and the 108, very obviously there is a periapical lucency compared to kind of that normal periodontal ligament space we see. And then I said, okay, I wanna look at it at another other view. So then I went into the axial and here you can see this is nine just coming in. 
it's kind of the distal edge of eight that we're catching. You can see again in irregular periodontal um, apical space, which is vastly different than its friend on the other side. Um, so in this case, we are really able to change our treatment plan. I went from not being very worried to eight to saying we need to treat eight and we need to extract eight because not only does it have much more significant bone loss than I expected, but we also were able to identify this periapical change that was completely unseen on radiographs. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes when I'm questioning anything about the cone beam, repeatedly seeing it in numerous views, right, it, we can completely confirm that this is a real pathology that we're finding. So this was a really, uh, this was a case that we totally changed kind of how we managed it. We already have a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> On the first one, um, the question was, what was the outcome? Oh, I'm sorry. God, I'm, spoiler alert. It did end up just being benign bony tissue. So um, nothing to worry about. And we had offered the owner, even after seeing the osseous mass, that we could continue to watch it. But she really wanted to make sure that it was nothing concerning. And the second question for case two, do you think probing would reveal this deep pockets without CBCT? Yeah, so the dog surprisingly didn't have a very deep pocket, um, which I think was probably in part due to the teeth being so crowded. So rather than truly not having a pocket, I think that we were just kind of hitting, crowding between the teeth. So there was only a P4 when we charted the dog. Um, so I think in these brachycephalics where they're so crowded, you become limited almost by what you can find with radiographs because the overlap and then probing sometimes can be misleading. Um, but it's unusual, like, not be able to get a deep pocket when you have that much bone loss. I think it was just any question. Any other questions? One right now. None? Okay. There was a question about the first case, Dr. Goldschmidt. That uh, bony um, pathology you saw, how do you appreciate w whether there is uh, any... Um, ligament around it, or if it's missing, or what, what, how, what made you think that you could actually have identified this bone defect and remove it? Were, were you able to zoom in on the, on the image, for instance? Yeah, so I think that why we thought we could go in and get it is it just, it doesn't look like it's adhered to the cortex of the bone at all. So what I thought that I actually might see is that it was just proliferative bone, right? So that it was very, very closely adhered to the bone and even just an expansion of the bone, which would have been much more difficult to sample. Um, but it is completely well-defined and isolated. So like here, when we look at it on the coronal, it wasn't attached to anything. Um, so that's why we thought we could go in and kind of scoop it out, which we were able to. It actually kind of like burst out of our little bone window very nicely. Mm, yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, cool. All right, well, crack on. So you'll see there's a trend of Shizus. We see a lot of Shizus at the U. Um, so our next case is Maggie. Maggie was a 12-year-old Shizu. She had a history of cups, so she comes in every three to four months for cleanings, and she's kind of uh, controlled on submicrobial doxycycline. She was very anti really doing any extractions. She wanted to be as conservative as possible. So when we look at the dental radiograph, um, definitely there is concern about the mesial aspect of the nine, right? We can see that there's definitely significant bone loss here. But when I look at the eight, I'm, I'm fairly underwhelmed. So, I mean, definitely there is horizontal bone loss, potentially 25 to 50%. But for an owner that's really committed, that's coming in every three months, this isn't something that I would rush to extract. But then when we look at the comb beam, we could actually really appreciate the extent of bone loss that didn't look that exciting on the dental radiographs. So especially when we look here at the nine, look at all this bone loss around the palatal root, which is going into the retrobulbar space. And then on the sagittal, we could see a lot of bone loss in that interdental space between nine and 10, especially when we look at this slice, oops, um, you can see that there's almost 75% bone loss on that distal root. So we were significantly 
underappreciating the bone when we were on radiographs and we were able to see it much clearer on the comb beam. So based on how severe it looked on the comb beam CT, we elected to extract. And you can see that when we raised the flap, look how significant that bone loss is. So this was just one of those examples where the x-ray, you know, didn't truly show the extent of pathology and we were able to prove that there was or kind of put confidence in our decision that really we needed to push this owner that it was time to extract because we could see the bone loss so much clearer on the comb beam CT. And it's always a little hard to show like little snaps, but as you kind of go through it fluidly, it became very clear that there was really significant bone loss surrounding that palatal root of nine and that distal root of eight. The other thing that was really great about using the comb beam in this case is we were able to see that the eights were sitting in the infraorbital canal. So it helped with our surgical planning to know that, you know, we really don't want to slip. We're essentially sitting within that canal. Um, the other time that we use this case is the eights did not come out very well. There was a fractured root tip. Um, and we took our post x-rays and we couldn't see anything, but it didn't come out very well. And this dog was, the photo I showed was not actually Maggie. She was only about a kick and a half. So you become really worried, am I missing something on these x-rays? So then we also use the comb beam to take a post-op scan. So using it intraoperatively, we were able to feel very confident that we weren't missing a root tip because of superimposition on the x-rays. There definitely wasn't a tiny root tip that had fallen into the canal or potentially was embedded in the bone. So um, we'll frequently not only pre-scan our cases, but use the comb beam intraoperatively to help us kind of look for root tips or kind of hone in on anatomical changes. So kind of staying with that Shizu train, um, here is another Shizu who kind of we use the comb beam in conjunction with our radiographs for our surgical planning. So he'd come in for periodontal disease treatment. So you can see when we look at his x-ray, um, he has an obvious, obvious TR lesion on 408, right? So that's a slam dunk. But then when we look at 409, there's like this little bit of change right here by the furcation. Um, definitely less opaque, definitely concerning. However, when we took out our explorer, we couldn't catch it all in this area. Um, there wasn't any stickiness, so it became very unclear, you know, is this just how this tooth looks and this is a weird dental anomaly, or is this also a tooth resorptive lesion? So traditionally, if I only had an x-ray, what we would offer to the owner at this point is we can extract it today because we're nervous, or, you know, we can see you again in three to six months and see if this looks any different, if this turns into a true tooth resorptive lesion. But then on the comb beam, it completely confirmed that this is a tooth resorptive lesion. So you can see on the sagittal here, this obvious bite into the tooth. But I actually think where it's much more clear is when we look on the axial view, look at this perfect 309. And then over here, a bite out of the tooth right there and a defect as well. So I would find that Tooth resorption in particular is a lot easier to see on the comb beam CT. Um, and a lot of times we use it as a confirma conf uh, confirmation tool um, to say, yes, that tooth resorption is real. Because sometimes, you know, you're on the fence. Is this a real lesion? Is it not? I can't feel it on my oral exam. So this allowed us to confirm that this truly was tooth resorption. And again, change our treatment plan for that patient on the day. Before I move on, are there any questions on those few cases, those collection of Shizus? There's a quick question here. You, you mentioned intraoperative imaging, and it looks like this case, you, um, you do this imaging right at the time of anesthesia. How long does it take you be, when you're ready to take a CT and you say, okay, now I want a CT, how long does it take you to take it and then see the image on the screen? Yeah, probably like five-ish minutes all in. Um, so that little kind of plate that we have, we move that when we do surgery. So we just have to lift the patient up, put it back under them, and then we just roll the CT back in the room. The scan itself is very quick. 
Um, as I said, we do our cases in dorsal. So when we scan them intraoperatively, we just scan them in dorsal. And on cases where we expect that we will want multiple scans throughout, sometimes we'll even do the whole procedure and leave that plate on the table. Um, so it's really easy. We have our comb beam directly outside of our dental suite. So it's really easy for us to roll it in, get a scan, roll it back out. Um, so I haven't felt at all like it's been a hindrance any more than stopping to take a few x-rays. Thank you. Yeah. All right, cool. So the next case I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna get a little more into some kind of weird and fun stuff, um, is Peanut. So Peanut was a 15 year old male neutered domestic short hair. So he had a previous history of an osteoma, was treated with a caudal mandibulectomy before my time. So he's treated back in 2016. Um, he presented to us actually during COVID because he had some new oral pain. So on a wake oral exam, we could see that he had very severe mandibular drift, had an obvious oral nasal fistula and had obvious tooth resorption. So what I expected is I expected that we would treat the oral nasal fistula and that was the cause of the pain. However, when we went to take dental radiographs, we actually found some things that were more surprising. So first off, you can see kind of right where that canine tooth was hitting, there was this proliferative bone, which was very abnormal. Um, we can see obvious tooth resorption, but the mesial aspect of the ostectomy looks pretty good. But then this was our caudal shot. So you could see that there was pretty obvious recurrence of the osteoma. The only thing we didn't know is how extensive was it, right? Because this is as far back as our plate could get. So in this case, if I only had dental radiographs, I would have said we can biopsy to confirm, but we can't remove all abnormal tissue because I don't know the extent of the abnormal tissue. Um, so luckily we have the comb beam in the room and we're able to do a scan. So immediately on that scan, you can see not only was that kind of caudal aspect of the mandible recurrence, but it extended all the way to the temporal mandibular joint. So all kind of the mandible that they left caudal to their previous surgery had developed into an osteoma. So at this point, because we could fully see the extent of the um, recurrence, we were able to offer them, hey, do you want to do an incisional biopsy or, because it's most likely recurrence, do you want us to remove all abnormal tissue? And they elected to remove all abnormal tissue kind of right at the time. Um, so we removed everything that we thought was there. We made a completely intraoral approach. However, like I said, I often use the comb bean intraoperatively. So we were able to scan where I thought I was done and see that there actually was a portion that was still left by the temporal mandibular joint. So if we had done a conventional CT for planning, at this point in the surgery, I probably wouldn't have known that I left this little piece there. It was only five millimeters. So now we are able to see, hey, there actually is a piece behind, you didn't get it all. And see exactly where it is and how big it is so I could approach this in a safe manner, right? This is a dangerous area to be in. The maxillary artery is running right here. So knowing exactly where I need to go really helped me with my surgical planning. And then we were able to get that remaining piece by the temporal mandibular joint and then do a final comb beam showing that all of it was removed and gone. Um, kind of just fun to see those little funny things that we saw right where the canine tooth was hitting. We can see are just very nicely well defined on the comb beam. So you can see that they truly are proliferative osseous bone. And then similar to that first case, we scooped these out and sent them in for pathology to confirm that it was just a proliferation reaction to the trauma. So this next case is another cat that I wanted to show just how I used the comb beam intraoperatively. And I think that's where it's like the most, it definitely helps us with pre-op, but where like we really love it is when we can use it intraoperatively because that is something that conventional CT you cannot do. Um, I guess pending your facility, but I mean, at a university, we can't stop halfway through a procedure and send the patient back to CT. Um, so this has allowed us to really tailor our plans intraoperatively, which has been amazing. 
So this was a six-year-old domestic short hair. She'd had a TMJ lux that had been out for about two weeks and we couldn't reduce it surgically. So she presented for a conjulectomy. You can see here's her original scan where we can see that the temporomandibular joint is not where it should be. So we decided, yes, we're gonna do the conjulectomy. And then I made an extra approach, everything's going great. And then the condyle broke. Um, so that portion of the condyle broke and now we're kind of left in this position of, uh, I don't know how much is left. I wanna make sure I'm approaching this surgically safe. Cause as we mentioned before, this is a dangerous area. Um, so we were able to do a comb beam during the procedure and show, hey, there actually is this large portion of the medial aspect of the condyle that's left. And then we were able to kind of better plan how we were going to surgically approach this and what to expect as far as how big of a piece we're really looking for. Um, so then you can see we also will continuously do a scan at the end to show, hey, we're happy with our conjulectomy site. There is no um, process that's left there that's going to be a problem and we expect this cat to go on and be comfortable. So definitely these are two cases where it was super helpful to have the comb beam in the room and be able to scan throughout. Any questions on those two cases or kind of using the comb beam throughout procedures? There is a, a question here, the, the size, what is the size of the Combin CT, uh, the, the size of the device, roughly? Uh, what can I relate it to? Like if you had a, a really wide fringe, I would say. So like it's, it's wide, um, but it's not very imposing. So like we can store it very easily. Um, we store it in an outpatient surgery room. You have more like specifics. That's kind of vague. Yeah, it's like I like to call it a, like a big card. But um, I haven't seen your facility, but I believe you have multiple um, tables next to each other. So yeah. it do, it doesn't um, the device is small enough that you can work on one and not interfere necessarily with something that might be happening on the table next to next to where you are with the device, for instance. Yeah, so we'll scan on one table while surgery is still happening on the other table, and that's safe as far as our radiation, and it's not really in the way. Um, but once we've taken our scan, we do roll it out of the room just so it's out of the way. Um, mm -hmm. Just because once we have all our anesthesia students and anesthesia team and my students, it's just it's a crowded room. But I think that if there weren't so many people in the room, that it could stay in the room and not be a nuisance. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on. So those were kind of some perio cases, endo cases that we'll use the vet cat for. Um, we obviously, as I showed you, will use it intraoperatively. The other place that we'll use it is if there are bony tumors or bony changes. So if there's a soft tissue tumor and we need contrast, we always use the conventional CT. But for bony tumors that we know we don't need that soft tissue information, we will use the comb beam CT instead. So this is a really interesting case, a 1.5 year old or one and a half year old female spade basset hound and she had fiber osseous disease. So we knew that what we were looking for is bone that was being turned into fibrous tissue. So we said, great, this is a perfect candidate for the comb beam CT to see the full extent of this lesion. So you can see on the comb beam CT, it, we can really nicely see this bone that is being expanded and changed into fibrous tissue. Um, so we can see it really nicely on the axial, here on the coronal, and then on the sagittal as well. So we were able to make our whole surgical plan based off the comb beam CT. So we were able to see very well and nicely delineated edges to where that fiber osseous disease ended and then planned on taking that with a one centimeter margin to prevent recurrence. Um, so a really nice way to kind of put all these images together is we will often use the 3D recon tool. So you can see at this 3D recon, we can really nicely see the extent of that fiber osseous change. Um, and here on the right, you can see this is the piece that was removed. So you can clearly see that kind of bone that was being changed to fibrous tissue and then this margin of normal bone around it. So. We'll use the uh, raw images for our surgical planning 
as far as measuring and making sure we're getting the margins we need. But it's really nice when you're thinking about things in 3D to have this 3D image up and to look at the 3D recon, which you can see comes out beautifully. And this is Lucy today. So she's definitely a little dipped in, but she's doing great and um, has had no recurrence of her fibrosis disease. So we'll definitely use it for bony tumors. That's actually the only bony tumor case I included, um, but it's a great option that we have it and we have it chair side. Um, the other place where it really shines, the same as a conventional CT is what we would traditionally go to is for jaw fractures. So we love using it for our jaw fracture cases. Um, so this case is Mia. She's a five-year-old female Spade Maltese and she was a big dog, little dog. So she came in and you can see on the dental radiographs, like it's fairly boring. So does, it wasn't very displaced when we took the radiograph. We can see, you know, this little sliver, oops, here by the eight. Um, we can see that maybe there's a bit of comminution, but it's really not very clear. We can also see that there's definitely severe periodontal disease, but it's not like a slam dunk path fracture on the dental radiographs. But when we look at it on the comb beam, we get so much more information about anatomy. So you can see that there was this lingual piece of mandibular bone that kind of butterflied off. Um, and then here on the sagittal, it's not the best view of how the fracture was. But again, we can look at it in other views. So we can see it in the coronal where it very clearly shows that, you know, there's this long oblique fracture, which is very, intimately associated with the bone loss on that eight. The other thing it allowed us to see is look how horrible the bone loss is on the other side. So this dog is a sneeze away from a path fracture on the other side. So it allows us to really see the extent of that bone loss surrounding these tooth roots and how that infects, affects the integrity of the mandible. I then use that tool that I showed you guys before that I really enjoy, which is that two-point oblique, which then kind of sets it up almost looking like a dental radiograph because it cuts through the view from mesial to distal. So you can see on this um, two-point oblique, it's very slam dunk, obvious path fracture associated with that eight. And we can tell a lot more about the anatomy of that fracture now to allow us for surgical planning. So we knew we had to take that eight out and then make a plan from there to compress these two, um, this oblique fracture segment, as well as capture that little piece of lingual cortex that was moving away. The other thing that's just fun about this case is just like check out the perio everywhere else, right? So it really can highlight severe kind of palatal vertical pockets, really wide PDL on this nine, you can see here's that little piece that broke off again. Um, so actually based on the comb beam, even though we still use radiographs, we can make a treatment plan based on the comb beam alone because it really clearly will point out periodontal disease. Here's another dog who had a pretty bad day um, who we use the comb beam for our surgical planning. So this is Wolfie. It's an 11-year-old male neutered cockapoo, and he was caught in a bear trap. So you can see this actually is Wolfie. He's not a model dog like the other dogs. Um, you can see that his kind of rostral mandible has been completely pulled forward. Um, and there's obviously a bilateral fracture. So what was tricky about this case is because there was so much displacement, it was hard to really get a sense of anatomy on dental radiographs. And even on the raw images of the comb beam CT, it was hard to really tell exactly what was going on because there was so much displacement of the fracture segments. So this was a case where we actually planned our whole surgery based off the 3D recon. Um, so we, you know, it was really hard to kind of go through the images and look at the dental radiographs. But then we went into that 3D recon tool and we could clearly see the anatomy of the fractures. So we could see this fracture right along that distal aspect of nine with this kind of comminuted piece. We could see the lateral luxation um, of the maxillary canine. And we could see this other fracture right by the mandibular canine. So based on this, we were able to kind of make a treatment plan about how best all these segments could come back together. 
And then the other thing we did is after we had done our fixation, we did a post-op to make sure we were happy with how things were lining up. Um, on top of this, we also placed an acrylic splint, which we reinforced with a final surclage wire. But before we placed that, we wanted to make sure we were happy with our alignment. Rather than putting a plate in the mouth, we decided just to re-comb beam the dog and make sure we were happy with how everything was lining up. So it's really useful, I think, in fracture cases, both intraoperatively, but then obviously also postoperatively. And then when we see this dog in eight weeks, we're gonna do a comb beam CT. So we'll do that in place of any radiographs. Any questions on using the comb beam for jaw fractures or trauma in general? Yeah, those are fantastic cases, in particular the use of the post-op or intraoperative imaging. There was a, a question about um, um, the timing of the initial scan. Hmm. It looks like you intubate the patient. So they're, you're going in, doing anesthesia, take the CT, and then go on with the procedure Im immediately. Is that true for every, every case? Yeah, so every case we drop them in sternal on the plates already on the table. So we induce in the dental suite. Then we immediately take our comb beam CT. We do our maxillary radiographs, and then we flip the dog into dorsal um, and do our mandibular radiographs and our surgery in dorsal recumbency. And then whenever we do intraoperative scans, we scan them in dorsal. Um, so we have the option to choose if we want kind of dorsal down or sternal down. So um, traditionally we do the first scan in sternal because it's easier for them to be perfectly straight and the image tends to be slightly better. because so when they're in dorsal, they often are a little bit rotated. Thank you. Yeah. So kind of staying on the trauma train, um, again, is something I love to use for our trauma cases. So here's a dog, Brown Bear. He's a one-year-old mixed breed dog and he was bit through a fence. So if I had this case and I had to say, hey, do you wanna drop $1,000 for a conventional CT? Um, you know, it's hard to say that we would have to go forward with that, right? And to convince an owner to do that because there was no obvious displacement. Um, all, all we saw was this soft tissue injury, but really in my ideal world, I wanna make sure that there's no trauma to the nasal bones, nothing's fallen into the nasal cavity. There's not like a piece of fence in there, right? So I'd always want imaging. So be, having the freedom to do chair side imaging and not having to kind of go through scheduling with the medical imaging department um, is allowed us to say like, yeah, let's image this case. And the owner was very on board with that. And when we did the imaging, we could see there was a nasal bone fracture. So we can see this fracture here. Can also see it really nicely on the axials. However, you can also see that it's completely non-displaced. So yes, we could say to the owner, yeah, there is a fracture, there was trauma. However, we don't need to do anything about it. Um, and then we're able to truly counsel them on what we expect as far as prognosis going forward. Um, so it's just absolutely lovely for using with trauma cases, and especially because they usually come in emergently and then you have the freedom to use it chair side um, and kind of make your plan right away. So the last case I'm going to show you guys is a really fun case that we did. We used um, the comb beam CT for planning a mandibular reconstruction. So this is a 10 year old male neutered golden and he had had a previous mandibulectomy for a CAA. Um, he had pretty severe drift and he was failing orthodontic training. So most traditionally we'll use orthodontic bands to train these dogs to go back into normal occlusion, but he failed and he was continuously having soft tissue trauma and he was continuously having discomfort. So we decided that we were gonna move forward with a mandibular reconstruction so we were able to use the comb beam to completely plan our surgery. So you can see here on the 3D recon, you can see the very large defect. And then what we did is we were able to measure from the apex of the canine tooth, kind of that remaining mandibular bone we had, and then also the remaining mandibular bone we had kind of from the angular process forward um, to help plan what kind of plate we could do and what our options were. And you can see actually in this case, we did the comb beam sedated. So occasionally we will not have them fully anesthetized if all we need is imaging and we're not planning on immediately going into a procedure. 
Um, and our orthopedics team uses it a lot and they also will do it under sedation rather than full anesthesia. So you can see based on the images we got from the comb beam, we were able to do a 3D print. So we printed one side of the mandible with the defect. And then we also were able to use the data to print a mirror image of what we wanted the mandible to look like. So a mirror image of the normal side. So we were able to print these in house based off the comb beam we have. And then based on this print, we were able to look at plate sizes and pre-contour our plate to kind of think about exactly how we wanted it to fit on the mandible and what was the best type of plate and size plate for what we were gonna be doing. So then you can see here we are intraoperatively. You can kind of see this, here's that distal portion of the bone and that rostral portion of the bone and our plate is placed. This is before we put in our collagen soaked BMP. Um, but then after the surgery was done, we did a comb beam and we were able to look at our screw alignment, make sure we were happy with how these screws were seated and also make sure we didn't hit the apex of the canine, right? So luckily we were shown that our surgical planning went well. We didn't have to emergently do a root canal, but we were able to come out of the OR, immediately scan this dog to make sure we were happy that we didn't need to go back into the OR and change our screws and decide yay or nay, we had to do a root canal. Um, and then once his mandible hopefully regrows from the BMPs, we will use the comb beam again under sedation to scan him and see how everything looks. Um, so this was really nice to be able to kind of plan this entire surgery just based on the information from the comb beam CT. So that's kind of my last case of my little series I put together. So I'm happy to answer any other questions that anybody has. Um, thank you so much. This is a, an amazing series. I, um, it's incredible how much you've done in a, such a short period of time. Just a few months, considering the fact that in between there were some major shutdowns of the hospital. Um, so you've, you've really um, done quite a bit. It's, it's very, very impressive. Um, it was a, um, we're going to open the, the microphone to everyone so we can have questions on, on the fly. But there was a a question about um, root canal therapy. Have you had a chance to use the CT for uh, endodontics? That is a very good question. Um, so we traditionally will use it preoperatively to decide, you know, does this tooth look non-vital? How does the periapical space look? We have not been using it that much to look at root canal fill. Um, so I think that I just would have to get more comfortable with that because when we see previous root canals and we're rechecking them, sometimes you can see space around your fill. And I don't know if that's just, and maybe David can speak to this, if that's just kind of slice artifact or if that's true void and air bubbles that we should be worried about. So when I first started using the comb beam, it's just there's a learning curve to finding out kind of what looks normal versus what is true pathology. And I haven't become that comfortable in kind of determining how happy I am with a root canal fill on a comb beam quite yet. Do you find, David, that a lot of people are using it for endo? I've seen it quite a bit, yes. And um, to address the question, the when the fill is not complete, if there is a bubble, for instance, it will be very obvious. Like you said earlier, all of these periodontal defects that are questionable on x-ray become very obvious on the CT. And I think that's the same experience with endodontics in spite of the density of the, the guta perca material. Any other questions anybody has? David, you're muted. Uh, there was a question about uh, various units or uh, if you have experience with, you said you have a conventional CT in the hospital. Um, how does that compare to what you've experienced otherwise in terms of practicality of the device and maybe um, uh, the, the speed or image quality? Yeah, so for bone, 
I prefer the comb beam CT because we can get much uh, smaller slice thickness and I think find it much sharper. Um, and the practicality is like unbelievably better to have something chair side. So for us to schedule a conventional CT, often they fill up and we have to kind of go days in advance. We have to beg if a jaw fracture comes in. So having something that I control in my room is incredible. Um, and for bone, I actually do find the quality is often better because we're able to go to a slice thickness of about 0.3 versus on a conventional CT, often the slice thickness is one. Sometimes they'll do down to 0.5, depending on how big the scan is. Um, the time that I find we have to do conventional CT over the comb beam is when we need contrast. Um, so when we're looking at tumors that have a soft tissue component, that's when I'll always use the conventional CT especially if I'm wanting to look at the lymph nodes and see if they have any evidence or anything I'm suspicious of for metastasis or I'm including the lungs. Um, so essentially everything that is not a tumor that I need soft tissue planning for, I use the comb beam. Um, so I really, really enjoy it. Uh, thank yeah. you, I'm just uh, trying to see if there are one. more more questions. Yes, there's another one. Um, are you taking two scans of the larger dogs, anterior and posterior, for routine scanning? That is a great question, and the answer is yes. So on bigger dogs, we do need to take two scans. We often do include the TMJ in our scan just to make sure if a dog is painful. But in reality, if you knew that you, know, you weren't that worried about the TMJ, you just wanted to focus on the teeth, you probably could even do a large dog with just one scan, as long as you centered it very well. But normally for us, we do need two scans. Um, the way that we'll do it is we'll do our first scan, we'll let it load. I will look through it quick and then I'll say, yay or nay, we need a second scan. Like I won't look for pathology, I'll just screen it. Um, and then we'll just slightly move it and get another scan. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Rajmi, this was a fantastic presentation. Um, again, thank you for uh, spending the time putting it together and sharing your early experience with us. We can't wait to see how much more you'll do it. You've already covered so much in such a short period of time. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. And I've tried to unmute everyone, but everyone keeps muting themselves back. So <laughs> <laughs> if you have a question, um, this is a great time to ask it. Um, we still have 11 minutes to go, and Dr. Goldschmidt is planning to stay and answer those questions if you have them for us. I'm sorry. I know I talk fast, so probably went a little <laughs> quick. <laughs> this, this is good. This is, this is great. I think I tried to unmute everybody, and yes. I think I did, so I, I believe... They're going back to mute. Oh, okay. Dr. Angel? Yes, hello. Hi, hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Good. I need my, my uh, unit to have a little spartan on it. I saw your gopher on yours. Yes. Nice. So that's just a sticker, but apparently you can get like the whole thing painted and outfitted. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't need. I don't <laughs> need a Buckeye one. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There have been a couple of custom made colors out there. Well, Buckeyes, O H I O. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow Rufus comes back at uh, every time we get to meet, so that's that's awesome. Thank you. I have I have a quick question. This is Tony Woodward. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. yes yeah, my work. question is, how obtrusive is it? How hard is it when you wheel this up and you've got a patient in? I guess, I don't know if you can do them in any recumbency you have, but do you have to kind of lift them up and pull the head out off the table or, or like how much repositioning is involved? Uh, yeah. So, to get the, you, cause you mentioned maybe five minutes all in yeah. from, from when you say, let's get a, a rad or let, let's get a scan to the time you're looking at it, five minutes all in if it's like in the room kind of semi ready to go that seems pretty fast yeah so for us we've kind of set up 
the station to be able for it to be easy. So you definitely do need to lift them up and like forward on the table. So you can see on the um, leopard, like how his head is on that thing that's in front of the table. Yeah. So for our first scan, when we induce them, we induce them on that. So they're like ready to go. Um, and then when we decide to do a scan, so after we've done our initial scan, we roll it directly outside the room. So it sits in the hallway directly outside the dental suite. So if we decide to do a scan, we just need to lift the dog up and pull him forward and slide that thing underneath. You can't, so I have not found that it looks good when it's in lateral. So they really need to be in sternal or dorsal. Mm -hmm. um, but because we do our whole surgeries in dorsal, all we need to do is lift them and then slide that under. And then we just reset though. You can see those like laser beams you just set the laser beams and then it's ready to go. Like the whole scan itself, I think takes three minutes. Um, so we've kind of set it up that we have one of those little trays per table. So we're not trying to like share them. Um, and then we leave those in the room and the scan is immediately outside the room. Um, so we found it very easy, even with like all the people that are in the room at any time to get it in and do a scan quickly. Okay. And then this one maybe is, is best addressed to David. David, what is the footprint in inches of the machine and the, and the height of it? So it's, um, if, we, if you go back, I think, Stephanie, you had an image of the device uh, right at the beginning. At the beginning. It's basically like a, a big um, uh, cart. Um, kind of an easier way to yeah, do thank it. You, thank Sorry. you. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> better feel for it there there we go so you you can get a feel for the size of the machine here um it's basically a, a large like a large cart and the height of it if you look at the screen the screen is roughly at the um, for a normal person's height um so the the device itself is that big cart and when the when the um when the, um, the gantry spins, it sort of takes a little bit of a, that width um, is such that it's a little wider as it spins around. So you need that room for it to spin around. Uh -huh. But that's right there, the, um, the size of the device. And if you're interested, I can certainly send you the exact measurements. So people yes. will actually use that to put on their um, a room plan, for instance, to get a feel for the, the workflow before they get the machine. And is that, is it plexiglass or glass or plastic or whatever it is, is that lead impregnated? Yes, yeah, so this particular device, yes, has uh, lead inside the machine itself, actually. So you, you see those panels on the side on this one that does have, this is lead shields, but there's also lead within the machine itself. And as a result, when you're behind it, where the screen stands, mm -hmm. you're actually protected from x-rays. Okay. And then I guess my last question would be, and I would assume this is true, but I'm not sure, but I would think that a golden gopher would probably give better images than, than a buckeye, although I'm not certain. I don't know if you've tested that. <laughs> I don't know. I would think so too. Just intuitively, that's how it would seem to me, but I'm just basing that on intuition, no fact. I like that. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Yeah. Happy Guys, lead the way every uh, day. There's Thank one you. more Thank question you. here. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know if you have experience with it. Somebody, there was a question about what else you can do with the cone beam CT outside of the oral cavity. You actually did mention that uh, your orthopedic colleagues are using it. What, what do they do with it? Yeah, so our orthopods will use it when they're looking at like angular limb deformities or they're doing um, like wrists or for, like smaller dogs, they can look at elbows and knees. It does become limited in size in a bigger dog, but they are starting to use it more in times in place of radiograph to see it in um, so they're just getting more used to it, just kind of like how I got more used to it. Um, but actually one of them just put in a grant to do a study looking at osteoarthritis 
and using the cone beam as a way to look at osteoarthritis in the joints rather than a conventional CT. So you could use it for anything you could use bone for, um, like a, you would use a conventional CT for bone, but it just becomes a little more limited in really large dogs just because of the gantry is closed. So you couldn't do like a shoulder in a huge dog. Um, but they really like it. Our dermatology service doesn't currently use it, but has showed a lot of interest in learning more about how to use it to look at um, the tapanic bulla. Excellent. Uh, thank you. In fact, I think we have, earlier I saw Dr. Qureshi on the, on the list here who has a good amount of experience with ear imaging as well. Okay. Oh, there's more questions coming in. Okay, great. <laughs> oh, this is from Dr. McTaggart. My CBCT only takes 17 seconds. <laughs> did I did a super model. <laughs> yes, yeah, that the super she, fast one. She, Dr. Dr. McTaggart is correct. The, the, the actual scanning takes more like 20 seconds. Yeah. Um, um, so the the total time by the time the, the device comes in place, the scan takes about 20 seconds and then the image maybe another minute or so. So I think five minutes total by the time you, between the time you bring it in to the time you're completely done sounds, sounds quite, quite reasonable. Yes. And I think yeah. like for us, we've gotten better and better in positioning them. So you get quicker, you're doing less futzing with the lasers and figuring everything out. So now because we do every case and now that COVID is getting more behind us, I mean, we normally do four cases a day. So we're doing a lot of scans. You just get more comfortable with using it and setting it up quickly. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a little um, learning experience um, at the beginning. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Goldsmith, for this fantastic presentation. It was a real a pleasure and an honor to have you tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.